so forth. Um, and swelling of the brain and lupus, and she's got two small children and and um, some you know lots of other things going on. And she's only about what 24, 24 years old. So um, and what's her name again? Katie. So we're going to lift up Katie tonight at the mother's request. And um, is there anybody else? I mean, if, since we're going to pray and get started praying tonight, does anybody else have something specific? Um, Michelle. Uh, do we know how Miss Mary's doing? Mary now? Is she better? Because she was, she and, um, and Perry were both kind of fighting some pneumonia earlier this week as well. So we'll just lift them up also. Anybody else? No, I don't know what the progress report is. Here, you say. Okay. Uh, up until yesterday, you know, he had started setting up, started walking, and started trying to drink Insure. And uh, he, could, he could drink it, but he couldn't keep it down. He kept throwing it up. And so yesterday, the doctor said, we're going to try something else. And what they put him on a fruit-based protein liquid and he's been drinking it since yesterday afternoon and he has not thrown up today he's drank three bottles so the doctor says when you get up to eight bottles a day which we want you to get 2,000 calories a day he said you can go home so he's working on it but he went earlier today he had already drank three so he may have drank four or five by now I don't know but he's he's praising God He's chugging that, that. He's chugging that stuff, trying to go home. That's awesome, and he's able to drink it without a tube, right? I mean, he can. Yeah, awesome. That's praise God for that. Amen. Anybody else? Uh, Mary Earl, one of the ladies that comes on Friday night. Uh, there's two Marys, and and uh, she's a shorter one. Uh, she she had, I think probably was a stroke or a heart attack or something and uh, they had to get her uh, 911 to get her and they took her to, and she's in Athens Regional uh, as far as we know she's, she's doing alright she's stable uh, but we need to lift her up amen is there anybody else any other prayer requests anything all right. Well, let's just lift, it, lift these up. And, you know, one of the awesome things about God and the way things work is the Bible says that whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. And so you might need some healing yourself right now. So you might need healing in your body. You might need healing in your emotions. You might need healing in your mind. You might need some healing in your life going on right now. So just as you're lifting up these others, you know, just thank God for those others. And then we're also just trusting God that whatever it is we have need of, that we reap that. Amen. Because we're sowing prayer for those who those who need healing. Father, we lift these up to you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, first of all, we magnify Jesus. We magnify the blood of Jesus tonight. We magnify the blood of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you are our healer. You are our healer. You have paid the price already. With your stripes, you have already provided healing. You have already provided healing and health for every sickness, every disease, and every infirmity. Father, I thank you that it was was your plan. It was your desire that all the penalty of all sickness would be on Jesus on the cross. And I thank you that that penalty has already been paid. Father, we thank you that because Jesus was lifted up on that cross, that he took on himself all infirmity, all sickness, all disease, all, all manner of illnesses. And Father, we thank you that because that was your plan for salvation for us, that not only would he provide healing for our spirit, not only would he provide life for us, us, the new life, but he would also provide healing for our bodies and our minds. So Father, we lift up each one of these that needs prayer tonight. And we thank you, Lord, that already it has been done. It has already been finished. By the stripes of Jesus, they are already healed. We say that Katie, this young woman, is healed by the stripes of Jesus. We come against the swelling on her brain right now in Jesus' name. We speak to those conductive tissues that surround her brain and we command that inflammation to go down right now in Jesus name. We speak to every we speak to the root of this infirmity. We speak to its very root and we command
command the healing power of God to flow into her body now in Jesus' name. Father, that she would be supernaturally raised up and that she would give you glory, Father. She would give you the glory. She would know that the presence of God has touched her body, touched her life right now in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up Mary to you and we come against any destructive forces and or side effects from a stroke in Jesus' name. We say that she will fully recover. We say, Father, that every single bit of her neurological function is functioning in Jesus' name. We come against any kind of clotting, any kind of anything else that, that would have caused that stroke in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for complete and total recovery, that she recovers fully, Father, that she recovers all function, that she recovers all of her health in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We come against we come against all manner of pneumonia, all manner of asthma, all manner of allergy infection, all manner of those breathing functions that are being disrupted right now. We come against those things. In Miss Pat's body, in Miss Marinelle's body, in Mr. Perry's body, and throughout the congregation, we come against those symptoms in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you that Jesus Christ Himself has already borne our infirmities and carried our sicknesses, and with His stripes, we are healed. We are the healed of the Lord. Each and every one that we've lifted up before you tonight, Father, they are the healed of the Lord. We thank you, Father, that you continue to work miraculously in brother. Eddie's body. We thank you, Father God, that by his own testimony, he will live and not die, and he will declare the work of the Lord. We thank you, Father God, that his intestinal tract is functioning fully. We thank you, Father God, that his body is processing the nutrients that it needs to process. We thank you, Father God, that his, there is life. The life of God is flowing in his body now in Jesus' name, flowing through his veins, flowing through his digestive system, flowing in his body now in Jesus' name name. Life, life, life. We speak life in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you are good and your mercy endures forever. And we love you tonight, Father. We thank you that you have provided Jesus for us. We celebrate you tonight, Father, and we say that you are, you are our Father. You are our Heavenly Father. You are our El Shaddai. You are more than enough. You are more than enough. You are more than enough, Father. You are more than enough. Father, we thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. We thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. Father, we thank you that you are everything that we have need of tonight. And we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen if you believe it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Why don't y'all greet one another before you're seated? Eric, can I move this up a little? Hallelujah. All righty. Open up with me to John chapter 12 as you're uh, finding your seat again. A couple weeks ago, Apostle David was preaching on the anointing, and something happened to me as he was ministering. As he was ministering about the anointing, as he was sharing from his heart, just, you know, it was one of those messages, I, I said it before, I'll say it again, that it was just like, it was the heartbeat of apostle. And, you know, he, in his, the apostolic cry of his heart um, has to do with the anointing and the valuing of the anointing and, and the earnest desire to see men and women of God truly value the anointing of God. Amen. Not to take it for granted, but to earnestly um, seek after God 
for the sake of the anointing being increased in each and every one of our lives, in every aspect of ministry, um, for the anointing to be precious, to be, for it to be more valuable than it has been to us in the past. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things, you know, I think about the Apostle Paul and how he says in the epistles that he talks about, you know, all the, the trials and tribulations that he's endured, the, the shipwrecks in the sea many times, the stripes, the stonings, all of those things. And he talks about all of the, the trials and tribulations that he's been through. And then he says, in addition to that, the things that, that comes on me daily, which is the care of the church. And, you know, and you can see that in the scripture, how it is the apostolic fathering, building, um, it's, it's just their heartbeat. I just don't know any other way to say it other than that. But it's, it has, you know, it has everything to do with them having a fervent need, a fervent desire to see the church of the Lord Jesus Christ being built and established. And the condition of the church, you know, if you talk to apostle for any length of time, about, you know, things that are the way that things are today, you know, then you can, you can tell right away that the thing that bothers him more than anything is the condition of the church. You know, where, where is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Where is the church as we can see it clearly in the New Testament functioning with, with miracles, with signs and wonders, with people who are being added to the church daily, multitudes being born again, filled with Holy Ghost, you know, with the provision being right there for the church, for the work of God, where is that anointing? And he's so hungry for that. And when he shares from his heart in, in such a powerful way as he did a couple weeks ago, then if you, know, if you have ears to hear, it's like he who has ears, let him hear. If you have ears to hear what is coming out of his spirit, it, that was not coming out of David Coker, the man. That was coming out of apostle, the gift of apostle David in his spirit. And it's such a, such a deep cry, such a yearning for, you know, where is the church? Where are the people in the church? Where are the sons and daughters? Where are the men and women of God who are willing to take a stand for the anointing, who are willing to die to themselves, amen, for the sake of the anointing? And when he was ministering that, it was so powerful to me. It was just, it was so very tangible and so very um, real. And there was an intercession, I shared this with y'all last week, an intercession that came upon me um, during the time that he was ministering. And then he had us, you know, come forward. If that's, you know, just even to the altar, to a, a place to, to pray and to humble ourselves and to seek God and to ask God for, for more of that anointing. And I just went into, I went into an intercession. And as I shared with you all last week, what I realized afterwards is that really I was an intercession for myself. And in such a place to where my spirit man was praying, was interceding, um, for my soul, because in my case, it's been the things in my soul that have kept me from really pursuing the anointing to another degree, to another level. And, you know, all of us, there's, there's another level of the anointing available to each and every one of us right now. It doesn't matter where you are in your walk with God. It doesn't matter if you were just born again this afternoon, five minutes ago. It doesn't matter if you've been a believer for many years. It doesn't matter if you've been a faithful, spirit-filled, prayer warrior believer. If you've been somebody like Brother Hanley who prays diligently daily for decades. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in your personal walk with God. There is another level of anointing available for you. And that's something that, you know, it seems that the church... Um, has lost the desire to see the anointing increase. That it's just, you know, there's a willingness just to accept church as usual. You know, and if you have a lot of energy, if you have a lot of excitement, if you have a lot of hoopla going on, then that's acceptable in the American church today. All you have to do is look on Christian TV and you can see, you know, people, people being excited, right? I mean, they're definitely stirred up in some way. But then you wonder if you can pack arenas full. This is what, you know, I'm always, I'm the kind of person who asks a lot of questions about things. So if you can pack arenas full of tens of thousands of people who are there because they claim to be born again, and even in some cases claim to be filled with Holy Ghost, okay, you can pack these arenas full of these people and they seem to have such excitement, then why is this nation not being turned upside down right now? Where are they when they hit the doors? When they walk through the back doors, what happens then to their zeal 
for the, the kingdom of God? What happens then for the zeal of the Lord? What happens to that zeal? Is it really zeal of the Lord or is it just excitement? Is it just hype? Is it just emotion? Is it just the same kind of feeling that, you know, I used to get when I'd go to rock concerts? You know what I'm saying? Because I used to love to go to rock concerts. I mean, I love music and I used to love to go to concerts and I love that, that corporate anointing because that's what it is you get a group of people together there's a common purpose for them to be together there's something that that draws them together as one okay and it doesn't matter if it's a message or if it's music it doesn't matter what it is you know but people can get together and be in the same mind and of the same accord but that doesn't mean that it's God do you hear what I'm saying I mean, anybody who's ever been to a rock concert, you know that, you know, people get all excited and, and they're, you know, happy to be there. And there's, you know, all kinds of, you know, there's this whole sense of, you know, you can even feel a sense of community almost, you know. Um, but it's not, it, it's, um, it's, it's a different spirit. It's not the spirit of God. <laughs> and, you know, so I think that that's the thing that, you know, deeply in Apostle David's heart for him just to, to yearn, to earnestly desire, for him to earnestly strive and seek for the anointing of God to increase. And it has to, you know, the anointing, I think that um, as Christians, a lot of times, now this may just be speculation on my part, but, you know, you guys just say amen if you agree. But it seems that a lot of times what the church has done, what the church has done is they have, um, they have sought for the anointing to come down on the body, right, to come down on the church. Like they want to go to church to experience the anointing, right? We're going to, go to, we're going to go to the house of God to experience the anointing because it's a sensation to them. It's an, it's an experience. It's a feeling. And, you know, honestly, what's the difference between wanting to go to church to experience the feeling of the anointing and wanting to go to Six Flags and experience the feeling that you get when you get on a roller coaster? I mean, you know, it's the same kind of feeling. You know, you feel high, you feel low, you feel, whoo, you got all the hair on the back of your neck standing up. You even might let, throw your hands up in the air. You might shout. You might laugh. You might do all kinds of stuff. You might cry. I mean, I do all that at the same time on a roller coaster, Right. So, but, and in the same, in the same way, you know, a lot of times what we, what we've traded out in the body of Christ is we've traded out that thrilling experience for a true manifested anointing that abides in our lives. And see, it's not, and, and yes, it, the anointing can be thrilling, but that's not the purpose of the anointing. The purpose of the anointing is not so that the short hairs on the back of your necks, you know, stand up. That's not the purpose. The purpose is not for you to get goosebumps and the, not for you to, you know, say Shondai and for you to do a little chicken walk or whatever that little step is that Pastor Bill does when he gets real anointed. I don't, I don't even know. I can't even do it. So, you know, whatever, it's, that's not the purpose of the anointing, okay? And so when Apostle was sharing that from his heart, I mean, it just has pricked me and it has just stuck with me for the last two weeks. And I've just been, you know, just been searching my own heart Search in my own self. Okay, self, you know, you have become satisfied with things the way they are. If I wasn't satisfied with the way things the way they are, then I would see to it that things change. Because that's what happens, you know, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, then you finally do something about it. You know, it's not until the suffering of staying the same outweighs the suffering of change, and at that point, you change, right? And so, you know, what I recognized was that there hasn't been a lot of suffering over the fact that I was staying the same. And so my spirit in that case then could just jump in and begin to intercede. Okay, soul, whatever it is that you've been satisfied with, whatever's been okay for you, status quo, whatever, you know, you're feeling pretty good about the place where you are, the level where you've attained. All right, that's not good enough. Because God is saying, not Apostle, not Apostle David and not Apostle Bobby Jean, not Apostle Jonas, but God, Holy Ghost is saying, we're in a transition gateway. We're in a transition body of Christ. We are in a transition. And we are facing some of the, the most tremendous obstacles as the body of Christ that we have ever faced in the history of the body of Christ. I mean, since the, since the early church. So what is, what is going to cause victory for the kingdom? It's only going to be the anointing increasing in our lives individually. It's not for us to go to church and, and, and wait for the anointing to be cranked up at church. It's for us to get alone with our God and, and to, for that anointing to be cranked up in our lives. Because when the anointing is cranked up in our individual lives, then when we all come together at church, then it's like Holy Ghost explosion for real. You know what I'm talking about? Because, I mean, then we're already charged particles. 
You know, I mean, we've already got all of the, all of, you know, all of that surging anointing going through us and we're bumping off of each other. And, and that anointing then is, you know, is multiplying, multiplying because we're already, we come, we come with it. We're not waiting to get there to get it. You see what I'm saying? And so that's the thing. I mean, that's what God is challenging us with right now. And that's what he's trying to stir us up towards. And look, y'all, we have an awesome opportunity. The timing of this is impeccable. God is always on time. Always. We've got this conference coming up in just a few weeks. And he's saying to us right now, examine your own heart. Look into your own heart. Look at, examine the level of the anointing that you've been satisfied with, that you've been willing to strive for, and what are you willing to do to go to the next level? We've got an opportunity not to wait for the conference to get here for us to get supercharged, energized, you know, plugged into the battery, you know what I'm saying? But we've got an opportunity to already to, to build that momentum in the spirit so that by the time the conference gets here, we're already activated. You know what I'm saying? We're already charged. We're already, we've already stepped over into a new place in the anointing as individuals and as a corporate body. So then when others come in, then it's so much easier for them to access. And I just really sense there's like an urgency. I mean, in, in my spirit, there's an urgency, I think, in the spirit. I think that's what, you know, part of what Apostle was trying to share. You know, where are the people who are willing, Roy, to, to make changes, to suffer and, and, and to lay aside some things of their own flesh, their own soul, their own things, you know, in order for the sake of the anointing? Are we willing? Are we willing to go another step? Are we willing? So if, you're, um, if you found John chapter 12 by now, <laughs> hallelujah. John chapter 12, I just want to read this um, here in verse 23. Hallelujah. John 12, 23, it says, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And remember what Apostle talks about, about glory. You know, it's in our, um, the new mini book, Seven Keys to the Glory. Glorified doesn't mean that some, you know, halo comes upon him. You know, that's what a lot of religious people are thinking about when they talk about Jesus being glorified. That just means he's got some halo around his head. Well, my husband got a new phone today, and so I was, you know, messing with his phone, and I turned the little camera on, and I went to take a picture, and it looked like he had a halo around his head. But that doesn't mean he's glorified, right? That's not what that means. You know, some light shining around your head, that doesn't mean that you're glorified, all right? What does that mean? When you are in a glorified state, that means that, that the gift that's on the inside of you is in full manifestation, not just a little bit. This is springtime. So, you know, we've got all kinds of buds popping out everywhere, color coming up everywhere, you know, where there was no color yesterday. All of a sudden today we got some 80 degree weather and boom, there's some color. All right. Well, there's, there's some color in the bud, but even then it's not full manifestation. I got some bushes in my yard that has some lovely buds on them, but when those buds open all the way up, good gracious, that's going to be gorgeous. You know what I'm saying? So he's talking about the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified, meaning should should come into full manifestation of his gift. And of course, Jesus was, was talking about soon. It would be soon that the purpose for him to be here on planet earth would be fully manifested. All right. He'd already had signs and wonders and miracles, right? He'd already, he'd already, they had already seen multiple miracles raising from the dead. All kinds of things had already happened in Jesus's life. And yet he was not even yet fully glorified because he was not yet to a place in his walk where his, the gift, the purpose that God had on the inside of him was fully manifested, but it was coming. All right. Everybody say it's coming. So he says, most assuredly, I say to you, okay, so this is, he's talking about how is that full manifestation of that glory going to happen in your life? How is it going to be possible? Even though that there has been a measure of the anointing, right? I mean, Jesus walks through crowds, people get healed. Jesus says, stretch forth your hand. The hand stretches forth. Jesus says, open your eyes and see people see Jesus, you know, looses the, the dumb man. He, the, the woman with the issue of blood is healed. I mean, all these people getting healed. All right. And yet the gift that's on the inside of him is still not glorified. Well, you know what would happen if that was the church today? The church today would just rock back on its laurels and say, hey, that's pretty good stuff right there. I'm good. I'm good. We had some, we got a little spit of miracles over here during the latter rain movement. We got a little flow of miracles over here during the, you know, the charismatic movement. We got a few flow of miracles over here going on in the early stages of the word of faith movement. We're good. It's all good. 
There, in the last hundred years, people have been filled with Holy Ghost. Some folks have been miraculously healed. Even maybe a person or two raised up from the dead. So we're good. Come on. That's, what the, that's where the church has been. They're okay. It's okay. Because we've talked about Jesus. Jesus you know, we've mentioned Jesus from time to time. We've had a few miracles here and there. We've had some salvations here and there. So we're good. Well, if Jesus was willing to rest at that level and not go to the full manifestation of his glory, you and I would not be sitting here today. Okay, I would be dead by now. Okay, I wouldn't have made it past 22 years old when I met Christ. I wouldn't have made it because I was barely hanging on. I was so suicidal it wasn't even funny. I was depressed. I was alcoholic. I was just trying whatever I could try, possibly try to numb the pain in my life. I would not have made it one more year, T, if it hadn't been for Jesus. I wouldn't have. I would not be here today. If I wasn't here today, then I would not have had children. They wouldn't be here today. There's people who are here in this house that, whose lives would be different because I wasn't here. The people would around, all around you, their lives would be different because you wouldn't be here. Most of y'all, I know most you know, of y'all's testimony. Y'all wouldn't be here neither, Roy. You wouldn't have been here. You would have been long gone. Okay? Well, if, if the church was, you know, the, we have got to take our example from Jesus. If he wasn't willing to just settle for some people believing, some people being healed, some people being raised from the dead, he wasn't willing to settle for that. He was willing to go the full distance. He was willing to go the full distance so that the gift, the purpose of God in his life was fully manifested. And so he's saying, this is what has to happen if you want the full manifestation of the glory. This next verse. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. What's he talking about? He's not talking, he didn't switch over topics. He's not talking about the fully manifested son of God, and then he's talking about farming. That's not what he's talking about. He's using an illustration. He's using an analogy. He's using the situation that they understood to let them, under, to let them know that, that to, for, in order for that fully manifested glory to be on the Son of Man, then that Son of Man had to be willing to allow that gift that was in him that would cause him to be the fully manifested Son of God to go into the ground and die. He had to be willing to die to that. He had to be willing to suffer. He had to be willing to lay those things down that, you know, he was receiving. We read this last week, y'all. He was already receiving praise. I mean, you, you get people healed, you're going to get praise of man. Right. So he was, I mean, he was, he was very well known. I don't know what, that I necessarily want to call him popular. He was popular with some and he was criticized by others, but that's the way popularity works. Right. And so, but he you know, he was widely recognized his, he had a stage. I would even say that in that point, in that time period in history, he had a world stage because people throughout the region knew who he was. Okay. They heard of him throughout all the land. Right. So he had a world stage, but that in order for his, that gift, the purpose to be fully manifested, he had to take that seed, which is that deposit of the gift, the purpose of God. And he had to be willing for that to be, to go into the ground and there to die. Now, look, I've done a, I've done a lot of teaching on this in the past. Not going to take time tonight, but if you study all around in the, in the word from the old Testament, all the way through the new then the ground itself is symbolic of destiny, of God's plan for your life. And God has a specific plan for each and every one of us. Before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you, right? Before all of your days were written, I mean, before you had any days, all of your days were written in his book, okay? I mean, he already had a plan. You didn't show up by accident. I mean, I've told you before, I'll tell you again. I mean, I was the product of, you know, just a a party, you know, 17 year olds hooking up. That was, you know, they didn't hardly know each other. I was an illegitimate child. But just because I was illegitimate and by no means whatsoever was I planned in the natural, God had a plan for me. God had a plan for you. I don't care how you ended up here. I don't care who your natural parents were. I don't care how good they were. And I don't care how sorry they were. Okay? Or anywhere on that spectrum, God had a plan for you. And that plan for you is about more than just you. 
But see, when you're willing to take whatever that gift is, that seed is the gift, okay? When you're willing to allow that gift that's on the inside of you to go into the ground, which is your destiny, your purpose, to fall down into that purpose and die there, okay? If you're willing to allow the gift of God that's on the inside of you to to just sink down deep into the purpose of God for your life and to die there, then it will spring forth. This is what it says. He, it, it, if it goes into the ground and dies, unless it goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, meaning if it goes into the ground and dies, it produces much grain. If you hold on to that seed, just like in the natural, if I had a grain of corn right here and I put it right here, it would stay a grain of corn for 10,000 years. I mean, you know, they find seed grains in, you know, the Pharaoh's tombs. I mean, thousands of years, those things can sit there and produce no life. Is it still a grain of corn? Yes, it is. Okay. Does it have the potential to, to go into the ground somewhere and spring up and be a corn stalk? Yeah. And a corn stalk in anybody else's garden but mine produces more than just one ear of corn. Right? And an ear of corn has hundreds of seeds on it. But only if that little grain of corn is going to go into the ground and die. So you think about that grain of corn. That's the gift. Okay? The ground is your purpose, your destiny. If you're willing to take that gift, even though that gift is getting some attention, even though that gift is, getting, is making some things happen, if you're willing to totally die to whatever is good, whatever's coming to your emotions, whatever's coming to your mind, whatever's coming to your thinking about what's going on with that gift of God in your life, if you're willing to die to those things, to that emotional high, that you get because you know you got a gift on the inside of you. If you're willing to die to all those things and allow that gift to be buried down deep into the purpose that God has for your life, then, then, then and only then can the full manifestation of that glory come up to your life. But it takes a level of dying. And you know what? It takes more and more every time that there needs to be more manifested glory in your life. It takes another level of dying. What are those flowers called that come back every year? I don't even know. Annuals, perennials, which one? Perennials Perennials come back all the time. Okay? So we are like perennials then. Okay? We're going to go into that ground, that seed, that flower seed, that bulb, whatever it is, it's going to go into the ground. It's going to die there. It decomposes. I mean, you know, you've seen those science videos. It actually decomposes and it comes all apart. And the life that's on the inside of that thing busts through it and, and shatters the crusty outside. And that seed comes forth, and then it's able to come up out of the ground, and it produces life, right? Well, those certain kinds of plants, they keep coming back year after year after year. Well, that's, that's us. Every new season in God, every new season in, in God's plan for our life, here we come again, okay? New, new levels of dying again the roots going down further and deeper and further and deeper into God's plan for our life. And that, that seed in there continuing to go through that dying process so that it springs forth new life again. Amen. That's when the anointing is necessary is to bring forth that life, right? To bring forth the life, the anointing of God brings forth the life of God. That's on the inside of your design. That's on the inside of that, that seed. Okay, and so that anointing, you know, it must go to a new level. It has to go to a new level so that that life of God that's on the inside of our seed can spring forth to new levels. And it's why it's not for you. It's not for you, because if if it, you know, if it dies, it produces much grain. Well, who is the partaker of that grain? Lots of other people. Right. Lots of other people. He who loves his life will lose it. If you love the life that you have with the gift that you have right now, then you will eventually lose it. In other words, if you become satisfied with where you are in your walk with God, if you become satisfied with the level of the anointing that's on your life right now today, then you will lose that anointing. You will lose that gift. You will lose it. Because essentially, the minute you become satisfied and you stop pressing for more, then essentially you're backslidden. You're not going forward. You're not going to stand still long because pretty soon then all that stuff in your soul is going to start pushing you back and back and back and start dragging you further, like I was talking about last week, start dragging you further and further and further away from God's plan for your life. 
So there are different degrees, y'all, of dying. There are different stages of dying. And so this is a time of life in the natural. It's spring. It's a new season, and we're singing it, and an apostle's seen it in the spirit. There's a new leaf being turned over. There's a new page in that book that's being turned over. It's a new season. But at the same time, out of the same gift, the apostle over this house is crying out of his spirit, where are the people who are willing to pay the price for the anointing? Well, why are those things being spoken at the same time? Because that is the way that we're going to transition into this next place. We cannot afford to be satisfied with what was behind. Amen. A few years ago, the Lord gave me this um, revelation, really. It was just, um, you know, God, a lot of times, because I'm a literary kind of person, he uses literary things to teach me stuff. And, and, and it's meaningful to me. And because of part of the gift that he's put on inside of me, I'm able to take that and share that with other people. So even if they're not literary, then it makes sense to them. Okay? And in the natural... Um, psychology, the, the realm of psychology, um, there are what's known as the five stages of grief, okay? And, you know, this is just, it's like a psychological process that was not necessarily discovered, but kind of coined. The phrase, the terminology was coined by um, a psychologist, Dr. Uh, uh, Keebler Ross, um, back in the, I don't know, 50s or 60s, something like that. And so what she was talking about is that there are stages that are very common when people are going through the grieving process, whether they have gotten a death sentence themselves, meaning that somebody has said, you have terminal cancer, you're not going to live, you know, something for themselves, or whether or not they are going through the grieving process having lost a a close loved one, or a marriage or a, you know, a a situation that is so precious to them, a relationship that's so precious to them. You can go through the grieving stages, you know, for various reasons, okay? And those five stages, um, the five stages of dying there, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, okay? So we're not going to focus on the psychological aspect of that because who cares? I mean, I don't care about that. We're talking about the realm of the spirit right now. Right now we're talking about in, we have this opportunity right now to seize this moment of being willing to do whatever it takes to die to ourselves daily, like the Apostle Paul says, so that we might have more of the anointing on our lives, right? So that we can fully see the full manifestation of the glory of the, of the gift of God that's on the inside of us in this next season, okay? So what I want to do, though, is I do want to kind of talk through these stages and just, you know, you ask your own self. I'm asking my own self. I mean, I've read through these over the last couple of weeks, and I've thought about it some, but, you know, it changes day to day. So I'm asking my own self, where am I? in these five stages? Where are you in these five stages? Where do you need to be in these five stages? Okay? So the first, the first stage then of dying, we're talking about dying. We're talking about needing to die spiritually, okay? About being willing to go to a new level, all right? That first stage, denial, that's a place where most Christians live. I feel fine. I feel good. You know, I mean, that's like what, what I was just talking about with Jesus. We got some miracles. We got some, you know, we got some stuff going on. I'm good. I don't need anything. I don't need to change, right? I'm better than I used to be. At least I'm not a heathen like I once was. At least I'm not drunk and slobbering all over myself all the time. I mean, you know, I'm better than I used to be, so I'm good. And that's, what, that's where a lot of people are willing to stop, right? Okay, I'm better off than most other people. Okay? I mean, I may not be perfect, and I know I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not them. You Pharisee. I mean, that's, that's, that's where a lot of people stay. You know? I mean, we measure ourselves. We're unwise. The Bible says you're unwise if you compare yourself among yourself. You're not supposed to measure yourself amongst yourself. It's not like, ooh, I'm better off than Tammy, so I'm okay. Or Tammy's saying, ooh, I'm better off than Michelle, so I'm okay. No. All right? It's, you know, it's that denial stage is where people say, you know what, I feel pretty good. I don't really need to seek God right now. You know, I mean, there was a time in my life where I had to fast and I had to pray. I had to pray 50, 60, 70 hours in tongues every week. I had to fast 40 days. You know, I mean, I just, I was scrawny and I was hungry and I was, you know, my tongue was dry and, you know, I was praying in tongues, getting all this revelation. Well, that was a different season in my life. I don't need it now. I'm guilty. I've done that, all right? People 
people at this stage, they start thinking about, you know what, I can, I can get by with this. I can keep making it with this. I'm, I might even be aware at this stage that there's a little something still hanging on, but it's okay. I can just, I can just keep going. And see, what we have to realize is that this stage of denial is conscious to some degree. We're doing, sometimes we just do it on purpose. But other times it's maybe unconscious. You know, it's something operating in our subconscious area. But it is a refusal to accept facts. <laughs> it's a refusal to accept the information and the reality that's relating to whatever that stronghold is in our lives. We all have some stronghold in our life that needs to die. Every one of us. I don't care how wonderful you are. I don't care how anointed you are. I don't care what a good person you are. Just because you got something in your life that needs to die doesn't make you a bad person. And it doesn't make you a sinner. It just makes you a person. Okay? It just makes you a person. And so, you know, what we do is we deny the fact that there is something that's holding on, holding us to this place in our life. When there's another place we could go, we don't even, we don't even pay attention to the other place because we're not looking for another place. If you're in that stage of denial, you're not looking for anywhere else because everything's good. You got that don't worry, be happy song playing through your mind all the time. Everything's good. Okay. Okay. And, you know, what, what this stage, we have to understand that this denial stage, all it is is a defense mechanism. That's all it is. It helps people to live with whatever problem they got longer than they should. Right? If I ignore the problem, then I don't have to face the problem, and I'm going to live, I'm going to sleep with these frogs one more night. One more night with these frogs. Right? I mean, for those of you who don't know, or people maybe listening online who never heard about that before, think about, the, think about Pharaoh in Egypt. Here comes Moses. You know, God says, if you don't let my people go, then he's going to send, you know, this plague, and that plague, and the other plague, and all these terrible plagues. And he goes to Pharaoh one time, and every time Pharaoh's like, I don't care. You know, just bring it on. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And he goes to Pharaoh after the Lord sent a plague of frogs. There's billions of frogs everywhere. Frogs everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's frogs. And, you know, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And, Mo and Pharaoh's like, you know, I'll think about it one more night. I mean, seriously, you got billions of frogs everywhere. What is there to think about? Just say, okay, get out of here and take your frogs with you. You know, I don't want Kermit in my house anymore. Take him. It's not easy being green, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just not. But... What, what it is, is the, that, that this stage is a defense mechanism, and it just helps us to, st to be like Pharaoh. We're just going to put up with it. We're going to keep putting up with it. I put up with it this long. I can put up with it some more. I made it till I'm, you know, however old, and I've had this in my life, and, you know, I'm still, I'm all right, so I can just keep going. No, you've made it where you are based on the things that you've done, the decisions that you've made, but that doesn't mean you can go further. And eventually, you're going to go backwards. So what, what happens is oftentimes people just get locked into this denial stage, and they never deal with any kind of major change because they're afraid, because they don't want to deal with any kind of major change. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to, to think about, oh, this, in order for this gift that's on the inside of me to become more fully manifested, then I'm going to have to die to myself. I'm going to have to allow Holy Ghost to deal with this stronghold. Anytime Holy Ghost starts dealing with a stronghold in your life, it's going to cause you pain. It's going to cause you emotional pain. You are going to have to face the fact that you are greedy, that you are selfish, that you are self-centered, that the whole entire world. My daddy used to say that, that I thought that the sun rose and set in my behind. He did not use that word that nicely, but that's what he said. That that's, what I, that's, that's what I thought, that the, the sun rose and set on me, that the whole entire universe revolved around me. I had a teacher ask me just earlier this week, what is wrong with these children? And I told her, well, this is what my daddy used to say. And that is, it is the, it is the nature of a child to be self-centered, to have the whole entire universe revolve around you. It doesn't matter that I'm busy doing something else. Whatever you got going on is going to be more important right now because it's you. You're more important. Okay? 
So what we need to understand is that if we can stay in this denial stage, it's going to keep us childish and immature. If you heard Pastor T preaching on Sunday night, he talked about those scriptures. You know, I can't feed you with the meat of the word because you can't only handle the milk. You're just immature. You got to grow up. Okay? And as long as, as long as you are able to stay at the denial stage, you will stay there. You can stay, people can stay at the denial stage forever. The church in the United States today is in the denial stage. Everything's good. Everything's fine. We don't need to change. We don't need to do anything differently. We don't need to make any adjustments. We certainly don't need to crucify our flesh any. We got all kinds of flesh, but we don't need to do nothing about it. Okay, that's where the church in the United States of America is today. And I can't say the church at large because I haven't been overseas in a couple decades. So I don't know what's going on over there. All right? But I know what's going on around here. I can look at the state of the church and say, wow, this, the church is in denial. Amen. So where are, are you there? Ask yourself that. Is there a stronghold? Is there a habit? Is there something that is keeping you right where it is and you have been refusing to deal with it because you're afraid? Because you're afraid you can't make it? Because you're afraid you can't face it? Are you because you want to ignore it because you're afraid someone else is going to see? Baby, everybody else can see. The whole world can see. Everybody else knows that you're all screwed up. Okay? Everybody else already knows that about you. You're not hiding. Okay? You're not hiding anything. Right? It's like, you know, those old cartoons where the ostrich sticks his head down in the dirt and he thinks he's hidden and the big old bird sticking up, his big old butt sticking up out of the, up in the air. Everybody can see your big old butt. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? You might have your head in the sand, but hello, you are showing your tail to everybody. Okay? So that, that is where, are you there right now? Are you there? We, all of us live there. We visit there every once in a while, but are you there right now? Well, if you are, you got to move on. Amen. At least move on to the next stage. The next stage is anger. Of course, you've been exposed. Your tail's sticking out. Everybody sees it. Now you know everybody sees it. So now you're mad. You're mad at God. It's not fair. It's not fair. Why do I have to fast and pray? Why do I have to do this again? God, I've done this already. I've already prayed and fasted. I've already meditated the word. I've already suffered. I've already lost a lot. I've already, put, I've already given up a lot for you. Why do I have to do this some more? It's not fair. I should have been enough. God, you're greedy. You're not ever satisfied. I, I can't ever please you. I mean, what we do is we start putting off on God all the feelings that we have towards mostly our fathers. Come on now. Mostly the feelings that we have, that we, that we withhold in ourselves towards our, our earthly dads. We start pushing that off on God. I can't ever please you. I can't ever satisfy you. I'm not ever good enough. Honey, that's all in you. That's all inside you. And so all of that anger, you know, this, and we say, this is all your fault, God, or this is all my mama's fault, or all my daddy's fault, or all my spouse's fault, or all the government's fault, or all the church's fault. It's all somebody else's fault, but it's not mine. I'm not going to own it. I'm not going to do anything about it. You know, this is where we start saying, you know, God, if you had done what you should have done, if you had really done what the word says, God, then I wouldn't be in this problem today. You know, if your word was really true, then I wouldn't be here today. You can't tell me you don't go there sometime. You feeling sorry for yourself, feeling a pity party, feeling like, you know what, if God was really real and he was really person of his word like he says he is, then none of this stuff would be happening. Because I know what I've done. I've fasted, I've prayed, I've done everything I'm supposed to do, I've tithed, I've come to church, I've done it all. So I've done it right. And so, you know what? Forget you. That's where we get. We get angry. And this anger, you know, I mean, it, it manifests itself in different ways. Some people, when they get angry, they act out. Right? Some people do that passive-aggressive angry. They close up. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing. Liar? <laughs> Liar? I used to try that mess on my husband if I, if I did that because I really wanted him to find out what was wrong because I wanted to blame him for everything. So I tried nothing. Well, he just, he just let me go. He didn't play. He's not going to play that. And then I'd get even more mad because he wasn't trying to find out what was really wrong with me. I'm talking to some people who've been there tonight. Amen. People who are dealing with emotional upset, 
Okay, you're dealing with some kind of emotional upheaval in your life. You're angry mostly at yourself. All right? I mean, I've shared that multiple times, my testimony, being abused, molested as a child. All of the anger that I was putting off on people, all of my teen life, all of my young adult life, all the way even up into my 30s, all of that anger that I was deflecting onto other people was because I was angry at myself. Because I was accusing myself of allowing people to take advantage of me and to hurt me. And I was living in unforgiveness towards myself. I was not forgiving myself. Anytime you are ever in a place where you know that there's something in your life that needs to break off, that's one of the first places you need to go. All of us. One of the first places we need to go is, okay, am I angry at myself for something that I did do or did not do or that I could have done in my past? Am I holding that against myself? Because if you are, then the way that's going to show up is you're going to take that out on everybody around you. So if you have these relationship cycles that happens the same way all the time, different people but same stuff, then that comes up because you're angry at yourself. Because that's the way you're treating yourself, so that's the way you're going to treat everybody else. You know what I'm saying? And it's because you've got this anger on the inside of you that you have got to put to death. You have got to release that anger. And you know what? The, the most powerful thing, the most powerful thing I think I've ever learned in my walk with God is just how to forgive myself. Now, there's work to be done because I recognize it every, in every cycle. In every cycle. I mean, I go through these stages just like you do. So I'll get angry. I'll get angry at situations, circumstances. I get angry at God. I'll get angry. And then I'll come back around and I'll realize, okay, I'm angry at me. Why am I angry at me? Oh, because I'm still holding this and this and this against myself. I'm accusing myself of being all these things that I'm saying that other people are accusing me of. Other people are not accusing me of that. I'm accusing me of that. And so that's where, you know, when you are in some way, when you are putting your flesh to death in some way, you're going to go through this process where you're angry. But just if we are aware, see, you know, I mean, if we have information, if we have the wisdom of God, if we have the knowledge of God, then when we're going through that stage, then we understand that we're not taking it out on our spouse. We're not taking it out on our friends, our children. We're not taking it out on the people around us because we at least recognize what it is. Okay? I am royally ticked off right now. You know, every single person that comes around me needs to just pay attention. Heads up. I am ticked off right now. I know I'm mad. I know I'm angry. I know I'm just like a a steam engine coming through town. I know that. All right? I know that ultimately I'm mad at myself and I'm mad at God. I'm not mad at you, but I'm just saying, give me some space here. Okay? (laughs) Give me some space here. Give me some time. You pray for me, you love me, you help me by not just being all up in my face, because that's not going to help me right now. (laughs) But at least be aware, you know, when you're going through that, at least be aware. I mean, we got to be, we have to be aware of what we're feeling and what we're going through and recognize that people around us are loving us. They're not trying to hurt us. They're trying to help us. All right. So don't lash out if you're in that anger stage, because God is requiring more of you. I didn't sign up for that, God. That's what I tell him all the time. I do. I mean, I'm just trying to be honest because I feel like if I'm honest with you, then those of y'all who are thinking those things, then you're not feeling like you're the only one. But I tell him that. God, I didn't sign up for all that. That's not, that's not, that was nowhere in the contract. That was not in the agreed upon terms. I do not recall this ever being brought up until now. I feel like that's dirty dealing with me. You know, you're going to trick me. I'm going to be, you know, following after you for 25, 26 years. And now you're going to tell me that this is what I have to do? That's not fair. This is recent conversation, right? That's why it's rolling. This is why it's rolling out of my mouth. That's not fair. I didn't agree to that. You tricked me. I got too far into this, and now you're telling me. Well, yeah, because if he had told me straight up up front, I would have never done any of it. Okay? So, you know, so why am I really angry? Well, it's because I don't get my way. Okay, well, what is that? Well, it's selfishness. It's because the, wor- the sun still rises and sets on me, just like my daddy said. Okay, you see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm dealing with this right now. I've been mad at God. I'm being honest. I've been mad at God. It's not fair. You didn't tell me that in advance. You didn't tell me that 18 years ago when you sent me here. I was going to have to do this and this. You didn't tell me that. I want out. I'm, I take it all back. Rewind. I didn't live here. I was never here. 
you never saw me. I'll do the Jedi trick, you know. <laughs> you never saw me. <laughs> I was not here. It doesn't work that way. Okay? So once we get, once we realize, okay, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, uh, you know, once we go through that, then what we start doing is we hit that bargaining stage. All right? All right, God. I'll do, this is where, you know, we're dying. We're like, okay, Lord, I realize this. I've got this wall. I've got this stronghold. I know I need to do some fasting and praying. I know I need to pray in tongues. I know I need to do these things, Lord. All right, all right. So I've gotten over the fact that it's not fair. I'll do it. All right. So I start, you know, start trying to deal with some of this stuff, get just a little ways in. And I'm like, all right, God, I'll do anything you want if I can just eat. Okay. I'll pray. I'll pray 40 hours a week. If I can just eat whatever I want to eat. If you don't make me fast, then I'll pray 40 hours a week, okay? Or vice versa. God, I can't pray in tongues this much. You know, I'll just, I'll read. I'll, I'll read a book of the Bible a day. As long as, as long as I don't, I'll read a book of the Bible. I'm a good reader. I love to read. I'll read a book of the Bible a day. If, as long as I don't have to pray in tongues for five hours a day. Okay, I'm good. I'll, I'll just, I'll do that. How about, how about if, if you'll go ahead, God, and, and you'll just go ahead and take this thing from me, so I don't have this pain anymore. If you'll just go ahead and take it from me, then I promise I'm going to do more better. <laughs> right, I'm going to do more better. I'm going to do better. Okay, I promise I won't, I promise I won't, I won't backslide any more than I've already backslidden. <laughs> I promise I won't, I won't keep doing these things. I promise, Lord, I'll do it. I'll do it. And this is where, you know, I find myself in this kind of bargaining stage a lot of times when I'm on my way to church, right? I'm on my way to church. I know i got to pick up the microphone in about 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, God, if I'll do this. I'll do this, God, if, you know, if you'll just, if you'll do that, you know. I mean, it's just, all right, God, I'm sorry, you know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been angry at you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the things I've said. I'm sorry. I got to go to church. I got to, I got to minister to the people. I'm sorry. So, you know, forgive me. And, you know, if you'll just, if you'll just help me with this right now, then I promise I'll do better this week. I don't do any better this week than I did the last week. You know what I'm saying? It's got to, you know what I'm saying? To you? It's got to, it's got to be a total change of spirit. You got to be doing it anyway. There's no bargaining with God. Okay? I mean, there is no bargaining with God. You do things his way. Because like Apostle David says, he's got a God complex. He thinks he's God. You don't bargain with him. You just do what he says. You just do it. So, you know, in, in the natural, people who are at the stage of death, you know, there's, there's often, psychologically, there's a lot of this bargaining that goes on, you know, just some kind of a compromise. You know, I don't really want to face death. I don't want to, I want to face death. If you'll just let me live. This is where you see people, you know, say things like, God, if you'll just let me live, I'll do this. If you let me live, I'll work for this charity or I'll, you know, I'll, get, I'll dedicate the rest of my life to you. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, people have testimonies where sometimes that, you know, gets really turned around. But what they don't know is that that was God's plan all along. It wasn't because God, you know, they strong armed God into letting them do something or not doing something. Right. But what we do is we, you know, we do that same thing. We, what we want to do is we try to negotiate our way through things with God because we want to put off facing whatever it is we got to face. The inevitable is that some part of you has to die. The inevitable is some part of me has to die. Something that I have to die. Right now, one of the things that I'm dealing with is that thing that I was just talking about. God has started to reveal to me some things that he is requiring of me now and in the the future. And he, in my mind, he sprung it on me. I I wasn't up for all that. And so, you know, so I've been, I've been trying to make this, you know, I mean, I've been in this place of, you know, after I getting over being angry, because I was real angry, I mean, like tears streaming angry for a few weeks. And so after getting over that place, then it's been this whole thing, okay, God, I'll do this if, you know, please, you know, just help me negotiate my way through it. But really, all I'm trying to do is just get to a place to where I feel better, come on, where it's easier for me to digest, where it's easier for me to go ahead and do what he says without having to really die fully to the thing that's kept me from doing it in the first place. And see, this is that, this is that place, you know, where there is not, there's never really a long-term solution. You can say, I'll do this, 
but then you're going you're gonna to slide back and not do that. And so, you know, what, you, what we have to do is we have to, we have to quit trying to put off until later what we need to just go ahead and take care of now. Instead of, you know, continuing trying to substitute, I want, I'll do this or this. If I don't have to do this, just go ahead and do what God's asking. Go ahead and do what is required. Here you are, back in John, here you are. You got this, you are this, you are this grain of wheat. You are, you have this gift. It's got to, you got to be willing to let that thing go into the, the destiny that he has planned for you to die there. You've got to be willing to let it go to, you, to, you, to whatever that thing is that's holding on to things the way they were in this last stage. You've got to be willing to let it go, to let it die. Whatever selfishness, whatever, whatever it is, whatever, whatever stronghold in your life that's been keeping you where it is, you've got to be willing to let it go and quit trying to substitute it for something else. It's a releasing. It has to happen. It's a releasing, right? So once then, this next stage then, once we finally just give up, and sometimes, honestly, when you give up at this stage, it's just because you feel beat up. I mean, you just feel like you've been in, in that wrestling match with the angel all night, right? And your hip's out of joint. Your nose is out of joint too, right? Everything's out of, you just, you know, you just give up. All right, you've been wrestling around with God. You've been, and finally you're like, fine, whatever. Good attitude, right? Whatever. I'll do it, fine. I'll do whatever you want, fine. But then what happens is you start feeling sorry for yourself because now things have to change and you know it. And so you go into this depression stage where you're depressed, you know, and you feel, and this, this is the place where you feel like I'm so far away from God. I'm so screwed up. I mean, these people looking at me, they think I got some kind of anointing on my life, some kind of special gift. Y'all don't have a clue how messed up I am. You know, I mean, and this is, this is the place where, where people start, they, they, they wallow around in that for a while. We, we wallow around in that for a while. I am so far away. I've seen all these things now. I've seen it. I'm so far away from God's perfect will for my life, so why even try? It's, it's hopeless. I can't do it. I'm, I'm, me- I'm going to mess it up anyway. Even if I try, I'm going to mess it up. So why bother trying? I can't do it. See, I hadn't, look, God, I got 27 years of walking with you to prove that I can't do it. I got 48 years of life to prove to you that I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm messed up. I can't do it. I'm a failure. I can't do it. And so then in this place, you know, where we realize that, you know, we cannot do it. You hear me? We cannot do it. Well, then the first, the first thing that happens then is we get overwhelmed with all of this, you know, sadness, regret. If we allow ourselves to sink into this place, then, you know, it's the pity party of the century, right? You're going to throw the pity party of the century. My husband knows somebody who's going through a, a, tra- a, a real tragedy right now. I mean, you know, his, his marriage is falling apart, and he's getting a divorce, and um, he's, you know, after 20-something years of marriage, three kids and a couple grandkids, you know, he's getting a divorce, and, you know, he's, he's in, he's in a, a bad spot. I mean, some of, some of y'all have been through it. Some of y'all understand what that is. It's a hard place. He's in a bad spot. But he's in this place right here, this depression place. I'm just a screw-up. I'm just messed up. I'm, I've always messed everything up. I'm never going to be any better. And, you know, he was talking to my husband. My husband, like I said, he just said, look, you know, I don't really like parties of any kind, but I definitely don't like pity parties, and I'm not coming to yours. That's what he said straight up on the phone. He's like, look, man, I love you. I'm here for you, but I will not be for, here for you through a pity party. So you realize, recognize at least that you're throwing yourself this pity party. And when you're ready to leave the party, let me know. I'll pick you up. (laughs) You know, you know what I'm saying? And that's kind of, that's kind of what, you know, we get to this place to where we're, you know, we're, we're feeling bad for ourselves. We feel sorry for ourselves. We feel all this regret. We feel all this remorse. But in this place is the opportunity that we have to just accept the grace of God. Because you are right. You are royally screwed up, and you always have been, and you always will be until the day you go home and be with the Lord, and you get your glorified body, and, you know, you have this spiritual understanding at a whole new level. We are always going to be messed up, 
at, some, at something. We're always going to be messed up to some degree. But the fact of the matter is that you're screwed up, you're screwed up, I'm screwed up, we're all screwed up, we're all in it together, hallelujah, we're all dependent on God, right? So I can't expect you to be perfect. That's like another thing, like what T was talking about Sunday night. I don't expect you to be perfect. I don't expect anybody around me to be perfect. I don't expect Apostle David to be perfect. I expect Jesus to be perfect because he is, and that's it. Apart from that, everybody else is screwed up. Everybody else is human. Everybody else is wrong about things. Everybody else is right about things. Everybody else has flaws and failures. But it is the grace of God that we, this, when we get to this place, this is when we have this opportunity to throw ourselves over onto the grace of God. And that is part of the dying because part of our human nature is me do it. That childish thing, me do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it my way. I can do it. I don't need your help. Uh, yes, you do. You know, <laughs> yes, you do. You done screwed this thing up about 50,000 times. Yes, you do. You need my help. You cannot do it alone. You need my help. And this is where, you know, T and I were talking about this a few weeks back. When you come to this place, this is the place where the body of Christ comes alongside. The grace that I have in my life, I can impart to you. If I've been through some of the things that you've gone through, I can impart that to you. I can help impart, I can impart that grace. I can help share the grace of God with you. I can, you know, link arms with you and lift you up. I'm not going to get down and wallow around in the mud with you. I am not going to do that. But if you come to the end of yourself in the hog pen of life and you realize that the Father's house has everything that you have need of, then you are willing and ready to stand up. Well, then I'm going to be right there and I'm going to link arms with you. I'm going to help you stand up. I'm going to help wash you off. I'm going to ignore the stink. I'm going to ignore the mud. I'm going to ignore all this stuff. And I'm going to help you stand up and walk through this. And you're going to do the same thing for me because that's what the body of Christ does. Amen. And that's where, you know, God's grace is able to come in and supernaturally help us because, you know, he has the work that he has begun. We have to realize that that he who has begun a good work in you, he will complete it until the day day of Jesus Christ. What he has begun in you, he's the one who's going to complete it. You are not going to complete it. And when we finally get that through our head, oh, I don't have to do this. <laughs> I don't have to be the one to figure it out. I don't have to be the one. All I have to do is yield to him. And yielding to him, you know, that's Holy Ghost has been the one to help us get to where we are today. He's the one who's going to help us. You know, Brother Roberson talks about this as the impasse, the stage of the impasse. If you go back and you listen to his tapes when he's talking about, you know, tongues for edification and that whole process of the dying process that you go through when you pray, 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 pray in tongues. Then you come up against this place. The impasse is the same thing as this place of depression. You come up, you come to the end of yourself, the absolute end of yourself. And when you come to the end of yourself, that's when, you know, you as yourself, you can get depressed and think, well, I can't do this anymore. I can't go through this anymore. But if you will just get a hold of of this one idea that Holy Ghost, he who has begun this good work in you, Holy Ghost who brought you all the way through to all these other stages, he's brought you through everything. He's brought you through hellfire. He's brought you through everything. He's brought you through the raging river. He's brought you through the tornado. He's brought you through all of these things. Holy Ghost himself is the one who's right there with you and shall be in you is what Jesus said. He's in you right now at the impasse to help you go through that impasse. You cannot do it by yourself. You are in the midst of the fiery furnace, but the fourth man is right there in the fire with you. And he is the one that will bring you through. And it is a yielding. It's a recognizing that, you know, I cannot do it, but thank God, God has been with me. He promised to never leave me or forsake me. He is still right here with me. He's still in me. And he, by his grace, I am going to make it through this thing because God has not failed me yet. And he never will. Amen. And so when you get through that stage then and you yield yourself to him, you quit feeling sorry for yourself, you quit quit trying to do it on your own, you realize you can't, you yield to his grace, you yield to Holy Ghost, then there's like, it's just like the weight of the world rolls off your shoulders because you realize, you know what? It's all God anyway. I really don't have to do this. I don't have to be the one to try to figure it out. I don't have to do it. It's him. And when you get to that place, then there's that fifth stage, right? That acceptance stage. It's going to be all right. Trina, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. 
you know, I can trust God to take care of this part too. I can trust him. I've trusted him through all these other things. I can trust him right here. I can trust him to fill me up with more of him. I can trust him to give me more of the grace. I can trust him to, you know, to, to show me, to give me the wisdom that I need. I can trust him to, to show me the relationships I need in my life. I can trust him to, I can trust him to help me with every single aspect. I do not have to know the answer. I don't have to know. I don't have to know how it's going to all work out. I trust him. I trust him. All I have to do, all you have to do, is we just have to purpose in our heart to know him more. Not to know more about what's going on. Not to know more about, you know, how we got here, why we got here, how we're going to get out. But to know him more. And see, there is an intimacy with God that comes in this stage because it is true. I mean, you realize that, you know what, I have just thrown myself completely at the, at the feet of the master. I have just completely rested in his arms. And I am trusting him in a way that I have never tr- been, trusted him before because I've just died to some of that mistrust, right? Some of those places where I have not been able to trust. I just died to all of that. Now I can trust him more. Now I can trust him in this new place. What it not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. See, we talked about that some last week when Jesus came to that place of dying to his own self and to, to his own desire to live. He said, you know, Lord, if it's, you know, I would like it if this cup could pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And when we get to this place where we can yield to this, then, you know, it is purely and totally based on our willingness to trust him. But when we get to this place, then we submit. This is where the Bible says, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself and he will exalt you in due time. This is where, you know, you, you come to this place of humbling yourself before him and he exalts you. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. It's due time. It's due time. Okay? It's due time. If you allow the Spirit of God to minister to you, then you can just travel through all five of these stages in one, one time of listening to it. I, I kind of sense that even in my spirit right now because there's some things that, you know, in my own self I've been dealing with, but just even just walking through these stages with y'all, thinking through it, I can even sense even now almost a relief in one particular area in my own life. Because, you know, you recognize, you acknowledge that this is God's plan for your life. He knows best. He does know best. And all we have to do is just, is just not quit. Not quit. And you know what? We're going to go through all five of these stages again and again and again. Every level. We'll, go, we'll just keep going through them. That's what happens because we're growing. Okay? And there's no shame to that. It's just, part of, it's just part of the process. It's part of that dying process. Amen? But it's dying to live. Back to that verse again. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. Well, I don't want to remain alone. I don't want, to, I don't want that gift just to be a gift not doing anything. I don't want it to be by itself. I don't want to just be... You know, a flash in the pan. Yeah, there were some things that happened, but, you know, what I want instead is I want to allow myself to sink down into that. I want to die to those things because then it produces much grain. I want that much grain. I want more of the anointing. I want more of the, um, the relationship with God. I want more of that closeness with Him. Amen? Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Well, that was my 10 minutes worth in an hour and 15 And um, so there we are. And um, don't forget, Friday night, Oasis, Saturday, outreach is going out. Um, Don't forget to be in prayer for all of those things. Be in prayer for the conference. It's going to be powerful, powerful. Get um, get registered and just be praying. You know, spend some time, you know, praying specifically for that. Amen. But y'all are dismissed. Love you. See you next time, whenever that is. Hallelujah. Look, Apostle's back in the house.